Hi, I'm Dr. Ray, and I'm uh, here today to talk to you about the internal and external genital development in the embryo and fetus. So uh, where this story begins uh, is in intermediate mesenchyme. Uh, so if you remember uh, way back when, before we had folding of the embryo, we had a uh, paraaxial mesoderm that was going to develop into somites. We had lateral mesoderm, which is going to develop into, uh, separate into two different kinds, the somatic and the splanchnic mesenchyme, with the overlying or underlying epithelium. And then we also had mesoderm in the middle called intermediate mesoderm. And this is the mesoderm that is going to uh, develop into the urogenital system. So when the embryo actually folds, the mesenchyme gets uh, carried ventrally, and it is going to lose its connection that it had with the somites. So the somites are going to be up here developing in this area, the paraaxial mesoderm. And as the embryo folds, you get this region that uh, is in this area, and it is um, going to uh, really develop into the, both the uh, urogenital uh, system, mainly the condensation here with the intermediate mesoderm structures that we're going to talk about. So that's where we're located. I just wanted to give you the heads up. I uh, highlighted them here because it's, it's uh, going to further separate out. The urogenital ridge further separates out into two parts. Um, in yellow, I highlighted the area uh, where we're going to have the developing kidneys and associated structures, and that's called the nephrogenic cord. And you had that lecture on the uh, urinary system in a different section. And then the other part of this ridge is actually on the medial side is going to develop into the gonads, and we call that section the gonadal ridge. So this is a cross section of the embryo uh, about this area here. Now, the sex cells, uh, the germ cells, that are going to develop into the sex cells of the ovary and the testis didn't originate back at the gonadal ridge. If you remember uh, a long way back when, we talked about how those germ cells actually originated in the walls of the umbilical vesicle where, uh, where the um, allantois was located at. And that these germ cells do migrate is one of the times in embryonic development where you actually have cells that move and, and the changing of position isn't just because of differential growth. So they're going to migrate back to the genital ridge and they're going to be incorporated into the developing gonads. Um, and so that's what you can uh, look at here. They're actually going to migrate along the dorsal mesentery. Uh, since we already did gut development, maybe that kind of um, help you kind of picture this process occurring. This is another view. Here's a cross section of the embryo or transverse section. And you can see the uh, germ cells migrating along um, the dorsal mesentery here to be incorporated into the gonadal ridge. Now, the underlying mesenchyme of the, the ridge is going to also uh, be important and in the gonadal development. And we'll see that in one second. All right, so uh, here we can see, again, we're, the big picture here that we have the folding and the area of the intermediate mesoderm and how you can see the developing mesonephros, which was uh, part of the, the um, urinary system. When you looked at this transient structure, it's going to be incorporated into uh, the gonads, especially for the male, and that's why it's important to note how close the gonadal ridge is to the mesonephros, which uh, is going to be incorporated into a lot of the ducts of the testis. All right, so this is a little closer up view. Now we're going to really talk about this, uh, the beginning stages of the gonad, which we're going to call the indifferent gonad. So at the beginning, um, the gonad looks the same regardless of whether it's going to develop into an ovary or a testis. So you have the epithelium on the outside, which is um, actually coming from uh, the mesentery on the dorsal wall of the developing embryo. And this epithelium is going to proliferate and it's also going to stimulate proliferation of the underlying mesenchyme and the, the ridge is going to bulge out. And so what we end up is having a gonad that is going to be sourced from three different origins. So the mesothelium that lined the posterior wall is going to be important for uh, making the epithelium. The underlying mesenchyme in the gonadal ridge itself, and then the primordial germ cells that migrated to the gonadal ridge. So these are the three sources of the gonadal tissue. 
This is what it looks like histologically. This is a picture from your textbook. Uh, and you can see uh, the primordial germ cells here. This is the epithelium. This is the dorsal mesentery here. This with just some mesentery, just with one layer of flattened cells. Uh, so this is the, where the peritoneal cavity is. And this is mesenchyme that's underneath the epithelium. And here you can see the mesonephros, the mesonephros. And this is the cartoon drawing from your textbook, so you can start to put some of these structures together. Here is where the mesonephros is located at. Here you can see the um, mesenchyme and the overlying epithelium pictured, and the blue dots are supposed to be the uh, germ cells. All right, the epithelium proliferates and projects downward into little uh, finger-like um, projections. And these finger-like projections are called uh, uh, primary sex cords. And so that's what's uh, depicted here. I think I already have them highlighted. There we go. There's one primary sex cord uh, and, and what it looks like. And this is going to be in both the uh, male and the female um, gonad. So at this point, the gonad is indifferent. All right, and um, so those primary sex cords that project downwards uh, is going to be part of the outer aspect of the gonad that we would call the cortex, and the inside of the gonad, uh, this area, is going to be the medulla. Um, and you can start to see the epithelium that sort of separates out, and so I can, you can highlight there those different regions, and they become important because uh, in the male, in the testis, one is going to develop further, and in the, the um, ovary, the opposite is actually going to develop further. So what makes uh, the gonad develop into a male or a female direction? Well, the chromosomal uh, genetic sex of the embryo is going to um, be dependent upon the testis determining factor that would be on the Y chromosome. So this testis determining factor has to be functional. Uh, and present in order for the embryo to develop in a male direction. If it's not functional or if it's not present, then the embryo is going to develop into a female direction. So this is sort of depicted in this cartoon that I kind of uh, put together for you. We can see all these different uh, sperm here that are trying to penetrate the egg, and you can see the one gets in, has a Y, has the uh, testis determining factor on the chromosome, and therefore this embryo under normal or typical development would De, uh, develop into a male direction. Now for, for a female embryo, um, you actually do need two X chromosomes to have a uh, typical development in a female direction, um, but you don't have to, it's not dependent on hormones, uh, all the hormones that are um, necessary for male development. So what you end up having is uh, the chromosomal complex that occurs at fertilization will actually make the gonad develop into a testis or it's going to develop into an ovary if the, uh, the testis determining factor isn't present. And then that gonad is going to uh, stimulate the development of the rest of the uh, genital tract. And so, so this is sort of the beginning place is to, does the ovary or testis develop and then everything follows that. And so there are some crucial hormones that are important for male uh, sex determination and for male development in the typical pattern. Uh, those are testosterone, dihydrotestosterone, which is actually a metabolite of testosterone, and that becomes important when you look at variations, and also anti-malarian hormone, which is, uh, can be shortened to AMH, and it can also be shortened to MIS, which is malarian inhibiting substance. So the, um, it's important to note that the ovary development is not dependent on hormones. All right, so for testis development, um, here if you have testis determining factor, it's going to make the primary sex cords develop further into seminiferous cords. And these seminiferous cords are gonna condense and proliferate in the medulla of the testis. And so what was an indifferent gonad is going to now go in the male direction and cause a lot of proliferation of these primary sex cords into seminiferous cords that will become seminiferous tubules, and they are going to condensate and proliferate more in the medulla of the developing gonad. And these uh, cords proliferate and they branch and they connect with each other, and so these uh, sex cords are going to develop into the seminiferous tubules that you see here. 
but also into straight tubules and reti testes that you can see uh, in this area as well. So this is a frontal view, and this is if we uh, closer up of a frontal view if we're just looking at one testis. Now the connection that these seminiferous uh, tubules or the primary sex cords had with the um, uh, overlying epithelium is lost and it becomes a thickening of the covering of this developing testis and we call that fibrous capsule the tunica albiginia and you can see that grossly it's uh, more thick and white and shiny uh, and that's what you're looking at on the outside of the testis. And the testis is also suspended uh, temporarily by an, its mesentery that attaches to the dorsal mesentery of the posterior abdominal wall and that is called the mesoarchium and you can see that here highlighted. And we're all gonna have that as well in the ovary, but it's sort of more of a transient structure uh, for the testis. Now, I wanted to show you this uh, slide. It kind of seems busy, but these are concepts that you're going to be working through and sort of um, holding on to for the rest of your career. And so, although it kind of seems that, a, a, that it might be a little bit beyond what you need to know per se, it is stuff you need to know. And so I'm trying to help integrate what you're gonna learn later on with what you need to know right now. And so the seminiferous tubules that are here depicted in yellow, this is a histology slide, and I just highlighted the area, this is from your textbook, I highlighted the areas that are the seminiferous tubule. Here's a tubule that's actually cut in cross section. And so you can see that these structures here um, have cells, all the little dots are cells, and there are two different types of cells that are going to be in um, the seminiferous tubules. And so they are going to differ from the cells that develop in the area between the tubules that is actually being derived from mesenchyme. And so this um, is important because the cells that come from mesenchyme between the tubules, uh, those special cells are called Leydig cells and those will be the cells that are going to secrete testosterone. And so um, they're very important cells and they're not in the tubules themselves, but they developed from the uh, mesenchyme. And so, and here's the highlighted structures, everything that came from the seminiferous tubules that I talked about, the straight tubules and the reti testes. All right, now the, uh, in contrast, the seminiferous tubules have two different cell types that are important. One is called a Sertoli cell, and the Sertoli cell is important at this moment because it's going to secrete anti-malarian hormone or a malarian inhibiting substance, uh, and uh, it's also going to secrete other things later on like inhibin, which is going to concentrate the testosterone in the seminiferous tubules, so it will be important later. Uh, but it also is going to have, the other cell type is the spermatogonia, which is the fancy word for the germ cells or the sex cells that are within the seminiferous tubules. So the cells that migrated from the walls of the umbilical vesicle near the elantois, those cells are going to actually end up lining the seminiferous tubules. All right. And uh, then to tie this in together, why we call it the urogenital system, is that this, this uh, internal genital structure, the testis, is going to remain connected to a urinary uh, system structure, the mesonephros. So although the mesonephros is going to generally regress eventually, it's not going to become the definitive kidney, some of these uh, parts of the mesonephros is going to persist. Um, one being the me mesonephric duct that's depicted here, and uh, several of the mesonephric tubules that come off of the duct. And um, the mesonephric tubules that persist are going to connect to the reti testis that developed from the sex cords within the developing testis. And we call these uh, connections the efferent ductules. So the efferent ductules are going to bring the sperm that is the uh, developed in the seminiferous tubules. They're going to travel through the straight tubules, through the reti testis, and then they're going to um, continue and be connected to the next major storage site and maturation site, which is called the epididymis. The connecting, the connecting tubules are called the efferent ductules. So they came from the um, mesonephric tubules. The mesonephric duct, which you'll see in a second, is actually going to uh, develop into this epididymis and also the vas deferens. So basically, this is, this is what happened. So I just wanted to give you a bigger picture. So here we have the gonadal ridge that is going to be next to the mesonephros, the developing mesonephros. It's actually on the medial side, but I'm just, let's say we're looking from the back forward just to make it clear. It's easier for me to draw here. 
And then most of the mesonephros is going to degenerate so that what you get is uh, some remnants. And so what you have in the end are the efferent ductules that are going to come from the mesonephric tubules and connect to the reedy testis of the testes. And the duct, mesonephric duct, the larger structure here that comes all the way down is going to um, connect to part of the urethra is actually um, going to be the uh, epididymis and the vas deferens. All right, for the ovary, the primary sex cords are going to make a rudimentary reti ovary that is going to condense in the, in the uh, middle of the ovary for the, a little while in the medulla, but those are going to re regress and disappear. Uh, and so the medulla of the ovary is not going to um, differentiate and proliferate as much as it does in the testis. Uh, and that, that is uh, because we're going to end up having the germ cells or the sex cells and the epithelium that grows from the cortex downward, we're going to have those incorporate on the more external surface of the ovary. The epithelium that grows is, is uh, the same kind of epithelium um, that started growing in the testis, so it's derived from the mesothelium that's on the, um, on the dorsal wall. And um, these sex cords are going to uh, break up and they're going to incorporate the germ cells and they're going to uh, end up uh, staying in more cortical position on the external part of the ovary. And so um, we call these um, uh, sex cords that are surrounded by a few uh, mesothelial cells, these flattened cells on the outside, um, we call them prim primordial follicles. And so here I can show you a, a histology picture of a primordial follicle. And here you can see, let's pretend like this is a, a germ cell here. And then uh, we can see these flattened follicular cells that were derived from the mesothelium of the dorsal wall. And we're going to call this uh, collectively a primordial ovarian follicle. Okay, so they can proliferate before birth. So you have active mitosis of the oogonia. Um, that's what we call these uh, primordial follicles. And, and um, as they develop, we refer to them as the oogonia. Um, and so they can, they can undergo mitosis before birth. But at birth, uh, they, they do not uh, remain mitotically active. Um, and so the ones that haven't degenerated by that time are going to enlarge, become primary oocytes. So they're not primordial follicles anymore, they're primary oocytes. And we, we talked about meiosis, um, and, or I have another video if you want to look at that, uh, you can understand why the name changes. And that is going to be in contrast to the, uh, the male uh, situation, which you can see uh, in this histology slide, which maybe is not the clearest slide. Uh, but the um, uh, spermatogonia that are in the walls of the seminiferous tubules in the male, they are going to produce sperm throughout the male's life at, from puberty until, um, until death, unless there's some sort of uh, uh, problem. And so with, uh, with the female though, um, basically the um, oogonia that the female has at birth, you're not going to get any more, and actually many of them are going to degenerate from that, from that beginning point. All right, uh, and similarly, like in the testis, the surface epithelium of the ovary is going to um, separate out from the underlying um, follicles that are developing, and it, it's not going to be as thick as the tunica albigenia in the testis. It's actually going to thin out, um, but it, we still refer to this in, uh, this time as a tunica albigenia. Um, and uh, it also has a mes... Uh, mesentery that attaches to the dorsal wall, attaches this developing ovary, and we call this the mesovarium. That's what you're looking at there. All right, now we have a new player. Uh, we haven't really talked about this player at all um, because we wanted to really talk about the indifferent gonads and their relationship to the mesonephros and what was going to happen with those structures. But this is just as important of a structure as the other structures. It just really doesn't play much of a role in the male development and it plays a, pri a, a primary role in the female development. So um, we're going we're gonna to introduce uh, her now. <laughs> so the... Um, uh, posterior abdominal wall, the mesothelium, that flattened one layer uh, cell, one cell layer thick uh, mesothelium is going to invaginate and it is going to make a new duct called the paramesonephric duct and this duct is going to run parallel alongside the mesonephros. It opens up into the peritoneal cavity and it is going to course inferiorly down into the pelvic region. That's uh, kind of depicted there in blue. 
And so this is what it, what it uh, looks like here. And so in this picture, you can see the mesonephros uh, here, the gonad developing here, and the, the mesonephric duct with the little tubules, and then the paramesonephric duct. So now we have all the players that are going to play a role. Um, and, and they open up into the peritoneal cavity superiorly and inferiorly. They're actually going to end up joining uh, from one side to another uh, and meeting in the midline. Okay, but so we're going to get back to that picture. Right now we're going to talk about how the paramephric mesonephric duct, which is in both the developing male and the developing female embryo, is going to re completely regress or hopefully completely regress in the male. And this happens because of the malarian inhibiting substance that the Sertoli cells are making. And so this substance is crucial, otherwise the paramesonephric duct is going to fail to regress. And so that's why uh, the Sertoli cells have to play their role here. And they, you can see the little blue dots of this of the figure here from your Morse textbook, and it's showing um, the uh, paramesonephric duct regressing. All right, um, and that because of the testosterone that the interstitial cells or the Leydig cells from, derived from mesenchyme are producing, um, you're going to get further development and kind of specialization of the mesonephric duct, the one that came from the mesonephros, and it's going to produce a really, really highly coiled um, structure that is the epididymis, the main storage and maturation site of sperm, and, uh, and also will continue to um, develop into the boss. And so um, here you can see other uh, male reproductive organs and where they came from, most of which are outpouching of endoderm, like the bulbo urethral glands are going to um, uh, become an outpouching or gland from the uh, urethra here. It's actually going to come from the spongy part of the urethra, although the glands sit in the, uh, alongside the floor of the pelvis which you would associate more with the membranous part, but they open up into the spongy part of the urethra. The prostate is uh, a large gland that's an endodermal outgrowth from the prostatic part of the urethra, and actually has a lot of, of openings um, that empties its glandular contents into the prostatic urethra, so it's not just one duct. And then the seminal vesicle is actually, they're the very large ducts that are outgrowths from the mesonephric ducts, so that's why it's uh, depicted here in pink is because it's coming from the mesonephric duct just like the epididymis did and just like the vas deferens did. And so you can kind of associate that. Um, and that makes sense because the vas deferens actually comes up and comes around and terminates here as the ampulla and the seminal vesicle and the vas deferens have a shared um, duct that leads to the urethra called the ejaculatory duct. And so this all is stems from um, development. Okay, now we're back to the paramesonephric duct in the female. So in the female, the paramesonephric ducts um, are gonna continue to persist and continue to develop. They're going to, um, they course inferiorly and they cross uh, the midline, they meet each other in the middle and they form this Y-shaped uretovaginal primordium. So they're gonna develop into the uterus and part of the va vagina. Now, this structure, and this is like an oblique section, this is frontal, this is oblique. Here you have the mesonephros developing ovaries. Here you have the paramesonephric duct coming down. And it is going to, this uterovaginal primordium is going to make contact with the dorsal aspect of uh, this structure here. So if you, if you think about it, what is this structure here uh, developing into? So we're going to have um, this uh, turning into the, <laughs> losing my train of thought here, the bladder is what I'm trying to think of. And so um, this is, is going to be the bladder, but as you come down here, this is the elantois, and this is where the, um, the urogenital sinus is located at, and it's already separated off here from the rectum. So this whole structure here used to be the cloaca, but um, now we have the um, urogenital sinus here, and you're going to have connection of the urovaginal primordium with the dorsal aspect, which you, is going to create a proliferation and an outgrowth, and we call this outgrowth the sinus tubercle. All right, and so for the female, the mesonephric ducts are supposed to regress, so we don't need the efferent ductules. We don't need the vas deferens, and so these structures are going to uh, regress under normal um, circumstances, and the paramesonephric ducts are going to 
persist and develop further. Um, and so that's what you're looking at. You see a little bit of remnant structures there. Uh, we'll talk about those in a second. So I just want to reiterate again that the female sexual development during the fetal period doesn't, de doesn't depend on the presence of the ovaries being functional um, or any hormones. That if, if the testis determining factor is not there or not functional, it's gonna, the embryo is going to develop in a female direction. And you might be wondering, well, there's no ovaries, where are the estrogens coming from? Um, the estrogens are uh, coming from maternal ovaries, and the placenta is also uh, making estrogens um, for the uh, embryo and the fetus. So if there's no testosterone, there's no antimalarian hormone or malarian inhibiting substance, then you're going to have a typical female development. All right. Uh, and so we, we have some other um, organs that are going to develop from the, but in summary, what you need to know at this point is that the paramesonephric duct will make all of the uterine tube, it's going to make all of the uterus, and it's going to make the cranial third part of the vagina. So this is all going to come from the paramesonephric duct. Then over here, which I wish I had this picture and I was just trying to show you, the urogenital sinus that's separated off, the, all of this, um, well you don't see the rectum back here. So the urogenital sinus here, um, this is where the urethra is developing and then you see outpouching from the urethra which is going to make glands in the female just like you saw in the male. All right, and you might wonder um, about the uterus. It seems like an awful big organ to come from a little tiny duct. Um, but the, the endometrium, so the inner epithelium of the uterus is actually being uh, derived from the paramesonephric duct. And the surrounding mesenchyme, all depicted here in green, is going to make the uh, myometrium and then the connective tissue that underlines the epithelium. And so it's not, the duct itself is only making like this red portion and it's not making the whole uterus itself. I just want to make that kind of clear. All right. You might wonder um, how the uterus and how the uterine tubes and ovaries end up coming into their position. And that is because of the development and the folding of the embryo. Here you can see um, how the um, paramesonephric ducts um, come close to each other as you go from superior down inferiorly. And as they develop and they fuse, they end up being here in the midline and that's where the uterus is going to develop. And you can see where the ovaries were here on the medial aspect of the gonadal ridge, they actually get turned, so they're on the posterior aspects of the peritoneum that folded and made the paramesonephric duct that came together and made the uterus. So now you have, per you have peritoneum that connects the um, paramesonephric duct structures, which is gonna be in this case the uterus, but also the uterine tubes. Um, it connects it to the wall of the um, inferior ab abdomen or pelvis. And so we call that uh, peritoneum, which is double layered uh, because of the, uh, how, how they come together. We call this the broad ligament. And the ovaries end up being on the posterior side of this broad ligament. And the formation of this broad ligament separates the pelvis and makes these uh, pouches that are um, sort of fold reflections of peritoneum. And uh, the one that is between the uh, uterus and the rectum is called the rectouterine pouch. And the one that is between the bladder and the uterus is called the vesicouterine pouch in this area. So that's what you were seeing um, when you were looking inside the cadaver. All right, and this is just to show you those accessory glands. Uh, and how they um, became sort of outgrowths from the urethra and also um, that, that would be the periurethral glands here and the uh, urethral glands. And then there are also greater vestibular glands that ha have more of a mucus secretion and they are going to um, out grow out from the urogenital sinus. Okay, the, um, I'm kind of taking you two back to that oblique section. And uh, the uterovaginal primordium here, these are the paramesonephric um, ducts that came together and made the uterovaginal primordium. They're going to um, uh, make the urogenital sinus um, have this bulb that is going to grow out from it that we call the sinovaginal bulb. And so I kind of just depicted that here, where they sort of grow outwards. Um, and, and they are going to actually make up the caudal ends of the 
vagina. And so that's why the vagina is said to have uh, dual origins, is because it's going to have the uro uterovaginal primordium, which is coming from paramez and nephric ducts, and then it has the sinovaginal bulbs that are growing out from the urogenital sinus. So it ends up having, or is believed to have, two origins. Okay, there you go. All right. Now, you get some proliferation um, in, this, in this area here that we call the proliferation. Um, it closes off the opening, the vaginal plate. Uh, this, this vaginal plate is going to or is supposed to break down and, um, and therefore uh, result in having a lumen in the vagina. And it doesn't always happen that way, but um, that is the way it's supposed to happen, undergoing apoptosis. Um, for a long time, um, the actual lumen of the vagina is separated from the urogenital sinus by a membrane, and we call that membrane the hymen. It usually ruptures and it has a small um, opening in it um, at, at uh, birth, but uh, sometimes it doesn't, and so um, the hymen is, is sort of a structure, remnant structure that um, can be uh, examined for different purposes clinically. So there are some vestigial remnants of these ducts that are supposed to regress in both the male and the female, and they have kind of funky names. But you might see some of these, and they usually are not problems in patients unless they become um, swollen or infected for some reason. Um, and so uh, even though you have um, the mesonephric duct continue to develop in the male, um, and contribute to many structures, not all of it is supposed to remain. Some of it is supposed to regress. And so if you get a, a, some of the mesonephric duct um, that is cr too cranial to where it's supposed to develop um, the efferent ductules and you have a little extension here on the cranial aspect, that's called the appendix of the epididymis. And uh, if you have um, the cranial end of the paramesonephric duct persists, so all of the paramesonephric duct in the male is supposed to regress, uh, we call that the vesicular appendix, and that's usually also located uh, up here at the head of the testes. If you're on the caudal end, um, you can have mesonephric tubules that persist that are really, they were supposed to degenerate in this caudal region and only have the efferent ductules there, but if they persist, uh, we call that a paradidymis. Um, and then we have a couple other remnants that are not shown um, uh, that are really, um, some of which are normal, the prostatic utricle, which is a uh, sac-like structure that is the remnant of the, where the paramesonephric duct um, contacted the urogenital sinus, and this is it's there normally in the male, and the seminal colliculus, which is an elevation on the posterior wall of the prostatic uh, urethra is the adult derivative of the sinus tubercle. So both of these structures um, you wouldn't, are not depicted here, but you can see them in other textbooks. For the female, uh, the cranial end of the mesonephric duct, all, all of mesonephric duct really is supposed to um, degenerate, but if you have one there, you can have a little pouch there called the appendix uh, vesiculosa. If you have some of the tubules that persist from the mesonephros, um, we call that the Epuuferon, um, and they would they would be between the ovary and the uterine tube. That's where these little uh, cysts or remnants would be located at. If you have a little extension of the paramesonephric duct, um, you can uh, you can actually have that. I think this is uh, pretty common, and that's called the hydatid of Morgagni. Um, then if you come closer down between uh, the ovary and the uterus, you can get some different tubules from the mesonephric uh, tubules that persist, and we call those the perooferon, perooferon. And then not shown, you can have um, uh, Gartner duct cysts that will be parts of the mesonephric duct that can be in different places along the broad ligament that can um, persist. So, where you have a duct that was supposed to regress, even if the whole thing um, didn't stay, you get these little remnant structures. Okay, now external genitalia. So this is a uh, frontal view here of the area or the region of the embryo where the cloacal membrane was. Okay, so we're in the cloacal membrane area. Um, and that's what I wanted to uh, sort of pull you into. There is also a stage of genitalia, external genitalia development, that's called the indifferent stage because you can't tell whether the genitalia is going in a male or a female direction. And so it takes a long time um, until you can really definitively tell. 
And this, uh, the indifferent external genitalia is going to have three major components. And I, we have them colored here. So uh, on the cranial aspect of uh, this area here, which is really superficial to the, the place where the cloacal membrane is located at, you end up having some, some swelling, some proliferations. Uh, you have a tubercle called the genital tubercle that starts to develop. And then you have um, two swellings that also develop here that are sort of running more longitudinally. Um, in the midline, they're called urethral folds, and they are going to be uh, very close to, um, this is a urogenital membrane. If you look, you can see through these urethral folds if you're trying to get an idea of where you're located at. And then on the outer aspect of the urethral folds, you have another set pair of swellings, and we call those the labioscrotal folds. So this is where uh, the embryo starts off, regardless of whether it's going to develop into a male or a female. All right, and so uh, you can see here the phallus is going to enlarge into uh, the pedis or clitoris. So the, it ends up, um, the genital tubercle is going to enlarge in, in both sexes. And um, the urethral groove, that's what we're going to call this urethral groove, where you can see the urogenital membrane through this groove. The groove is just the opening here. All right, in males, the urethral folds are going to fuse in the midline. And essentially, um, the phallus is going to enlarge, proliferate and enlarge, and develop into a penis. And the urethral folds are going to close. And so the opening to the urethra is going to be all the way at the end of the penis where it's located at. That's where the external urethral orifice is located. And the fusion site we call the penile raphe. So you can see that here. Um, the ectoderm that is on the outside of the, uh, the tissue is going to invaginate and meet the spongy urethra, so which is derived from endoderm. And that's why the end of the urethra has um, epithelium that looks like skin instead of um, epithelium that looks like the urinary tract. So you have a, a transition of epithelium as you look through different parts of the male urethra. This fusion and development of the penis is very dependent on testosterone production by the interstitial cells of Leydig, and more specifically by dihydrotestosterone. So testosterone gets converted. And so if there is an issue with testosterone production or an issue with conversion of testosterone into dihydrotestosterone, then you're going to have disruption of the male external genitalial development. All right. Now, um, just like the uh, penis or the uh, the ure uh, the gosh losing my the urethral folds uh, merging here in the midline, you also have the labioscrotal folds that are going to fuse in the midline, and the these swellings are going to develop into the scrotum. Okay, and uh, the ectoderm also grows inwards which is going to end up becoming this circular fold of tissue that is going to develop into the foreskin of the penis. And so um, that's what this picture is trying to show you in this depiction. Now, the fusion that occurs in the labioscrotal folds may not happen uh, properly, or the fusion in the urethral folds may not happen properly. So you can end up having the opening of the external urethral uh, orifice happen in many different uh, places alongside the ventral aspect of the penis. And this condition is called hypospadia. And uh, so it really just depends on the fusion and where, where um, it failed to occur. In contrast, epispadia is where you don't have um, proliferation of the mesenchyme on the dorsal aspect of the penis, and so you have an opening of an external urethral orifice on the dorsal side that's not all the way at the tip. So epispadia is much less common than hypospadia, and it is often associated with extrophy of the bladder. For female external genital development, you're not going to have folds, I mean fusion of the folds or the, the swellings that we had uh, fuse in the male. 
And so you had the urethral folds that are in the midline and the labioscrotal folds that were outside of that. And you do have a little bit of fusion in the posterior aspect of both of these folds. Um, but for the rest of the course of the folds, they are going to remain unfused and will develop into the labia minora and the labia majora. The clitoris is uh, rather enlarged for a long period of time uh, during um, fetal development, uh, and so then it gradually gets smaller, or also the fetus is, the rest of the fetus is getting larger, and so it's differential growth. And then you can also have variations for females in uterine development. The paramesonephric ducts do not always come together uh, the way that they uh, are supposed to, and so you can have variations in the shape of the uterus depending on how fused the paramesonephric ducts were with each other or whether there was a lack of proliferation on one side um, or whether there is an absence or a regression on one side. So you can see all the different variations that can occur in these conditions. Okay, I hope that you enjoyed this um, and feel free to email me if you have any questions.